we get a lot of our, our ideas about what disruption in innovation really mean from the startup sector. UN digital leader and angel investor Khaled Eliouli is extremely well placed to explain how this relates to education today. He has backed mission driven startups, such as being the first European investor in Uber. He's been a backer of Deliveroo, Student.com, Worlab, Soldo, and Upgraded. He's here to share his thoughts on how we can tackle the most challenging problems without compromising financial returns that command access to capital, talent, and exposure. Please welcome Khaled Elioui. Thanks for coming this morning, and uh, I'm going to talk to you about a topic uh, that is very dear to my heart, which is how can we reduce the opportunity gap and tackle systemic issues. And my honest belief is the best way to do that is via entrepreneurship. So the first question I'm going to ask, like, where do you believe that job creation is coming from? Like, this is one of the things that is the least understood. It's not coming from big businesses. It's not coming from the big conglomerates that we talk about. If you look at the numbers from the US over the last 20 years, you can see that companies that are like over six years old have been maintaining the jobs as low as possible. I run a 500 employee company that had investors from the US. All of the discussions in the board were about how can we keep the employment as low as possible. Employment is coming from startups and from new companies. If you look at basically the numbers over the last 20 years, like on average in any given year, new companies have created one, from 1.5 to 2 million jobs every year. But it's not just about creating jobs. We need to think about like what kind of jobs and what kind of economy we're building. Because I really fundamentally believe that all, over, all revenue is not created equal. And we need to make sure that we create companies that bridge opportunity gap not that create further gap or basically increase the ones that we already have. I can give you the example of the gaming industry. I was running a gaming company called Big Point, and our vision was simple. It was great gaming for everybody. So we wanted to develop great games, but if you think about the origin of video games, most people could not afford it. To get a console, you have to spend 350 or $400. To buy a PC gaming system, you have to spend sometimes $1,000. How many people can afford that? Well, if you looked at the industry 20 years ago, it was 150 million people. It was an industry of $330 billion. Well, at Big Point, all of our games were available in any device that could have an internet connection. It was actually part of our product development thesis. If the game could not be played on the simplest phone or the simplest PCs, we were not developing them. And that's what allowed us to build a community of 400 million players. So like much bigger than the original industry. And the great thing when you have such a community is you can sensibilize them on topics that matter even more than what you do. And we collaborated with two incredible NGOs that allowed us to raise over $100,000 for Charity Water, which allowed us to provide clean and drinkable water for thousands of people in Africa, and over $300,000 for the Malala Fund, which is three times as much as what the Starbucks group raised last year. And we're just a small company. But we worked with Malala to integrate her campaign in our games. And that's where basically you see the power of community. And anybody in a power position has not only the opportunity to do this, but the responsibility to do this. Uh, but it's not the only thing. We can do more than actually reduce opportunity gap. I really believe that businesses can tackle systemic issues. If you look at the transport industry today, like the public offering is limited. You cannot access it when you want or where you want. And private offering is unequal and most of the time unaffordable. Not everybody can afford to take taxis. And so what does that lead to? It leads to a way too high level of car ownership, which is actually dangerous because a lot of people should actually not drive. And also dangerous because it's killing the environment. And this is another truth that we actually ignore. 1.3 million people are dying every year in car accidents. 1.3 million. 20 to 50 million end up being injured and completely compromising their lives in the accidents. How can we fix that? Can make campaigns, raise awareness? What about providing a system that allows you to book a car when you need it, just pushing a button? You have all this inventory of cars that has become a liability and an issue. Well, you provide this system that creates a new demand. This demand basically gives opportunity to have new drivers that actually are looking for jobs. This increase in drivers allows you basically to increase the coverage. 
cities and regions that didn't have access to taxis or like private offering now have access to mobility. This coverage allows you to reduce the pickup time. So people have to let, wait less to get the car. What does that do? That increases demand. And this is called a virtuous circle. It allows you to scale and grow as fast as possible. This is how a company that was started only seven years ago is now worth $70 billion and has created millions of jobs. But the beauty about this system is there's a secondary effect. You increase the coverage and the saturation, there's less downtime. Most of the drivers in taxis spend their time looking for a rider. If you have saturation, you don't have to do that, which allows you to reduce pricing. That increases demand. And you actually make private driving available to more people. What are the consequences of that beyond basically creating a lot of wealth? Well, first, not only basically it becomes cheaper to use Uber than take a taxi, you don't have to actually own a car. And so we can actually start considering to find a way to reduce the level of cars in the market. But beyond that, Uber is the busiest when the bars close. When we made a survey, 88% of people that were 21 plus basically like admitted that now they didn't have to actually drive after drinking using Uber. And 57% said that without a system like Uber, they would most likely consider driving after drinking. This is how you change, a model, you change an industry tackle system in case you, you create a new business model. What can you do? How can we basically expand that across the board? There's a number of things you can do, all of you. First, if you're in, in the educational background, I urge you, push as much as you can to initiate coding as early as you can. To further and to build an ecosystem, we need coders, we need designers, we need to push much more than what we have right now. You need to include entrepreneurs in your boards. Even the most famous, uh, basically, universities look at Harvard and Stanford. Do they have young entrepreneurs in their boards? No, they have CEOs of big companies. They're not building jobs. They're not tackling these issues. Include young entrepreneurs that are promising and really going after big things in your boards. And then finally, promote professional experience as early as possible. We need people doing things, not only learning. Expand the vocation beyond the, the obvious candidates. One of the key issues that we have is we're not promoting the role models as much as we can. And also, and that's also like a fair point, only our starting company, or mostly our starting company, people who can afford it. We need to create safety nets, provide like loans and provide like free healthcare and ability for more people, especially people coming from less likely backgrounds to start companies because they're the most likely to find the solution. And then you basically, you'll expand these vocations. This like, is a quick summary of the, the meaning that I'm giving to, to my capital. So these are all companies that I invested in early stage. They're all tackling big issues that we absolutely have to fix over the next few years. You do not have to only invest in real estate. You do not have only to invest in public companies. You can get involved in early stage companies and you would be surprised and shocked about the number of businesses that were one salary away from running out of business. The last point that I want to finish on, I'm coming from Tunisia, and a big part of why I've been successful because of the investment that I've been done in my country. And there are many more entrepreneurs and incredible people that are far more courageous than me, that have led the revolution, that need and require your support. There's a lot of things you can do. I've summarized like a few startups that have already raised a few million euro over this year, and I've already invested in a couple that are obviously led by women. And you can, you should you'll be amazed to see like the drive and the engagement that you have on the ground. And they all welcome you. And I'm going to finish on this. This was a Saturday morning in December where you had like hundreds of kids that traveled from all over the country to come and spend time working in teams and coming up with new projects. And they're all waiting for you and getting your support. Invest in the yacht. Don't just talk about it. Thank you. <laughs>